June 15, 1944, just nine days after D-Day in Normandy, on the far side of the world, another invasion fleet is about to land its troops. When they hit the beaches of Saipan, U.S. fighting men will be on Japanese soil for the first time in the Pacific War. The battle for the island of Saipan will be savage. Against massed Japanese tanks and artillery, its capture takes three long, bloody weeks. In the biggest bonsai charge of World War II, more than 3,000 Japanese will charge American troops head on. It was hand grenades, it was bayonets, it was cane rifles, it was butts of rifles. It was a fight and counter fight all the way to the end. Nothing can be left to chance in this decisive battle. In the days and weeks leading up to the attack, American reconnaissance aircraft roam the sky above Saipan. Their photographs are used to brief men on their way to the landing beaches. Buried in the archives for 60 years, these images give us a unique insight into the coming battle. Linked with the latest computer technology, the photographs pinpoint the key stages of the invasion. You dread the next day, you know, you do because it's gonna be the same things all over again. Kill or be killed. And uh, there was a lot of killing. You know, there was no quarter given either way. For the first time, we see in detail the vital landing beaches and airfields, the death-filled ravines and sugarcane fields of the Battle of Saipan. June 15, 1944, D-Day. As dawn breaks, two American battleships, two cruisers, and seven destroyers approach the Japanese-held island of Saipan. Behind them is an invasion fleet carrying 70,000 men of the 5th Amphibious Corps. Their mission, to take the island. Ahead of the men waiting in the transports lie their target beaches, on the rocky west coast of the island. They know the Japanese are lying in wait. Before they can land, the Navy must plow the road. The warships open up with a deafening gun and rocket barrage. The sound was just horrific. Very often, people describe the sound of naval gunfire overhead as sounding like freight trains. No freight train was, was ever that horrible to listen to. It was, it was difficult to think with that much overhead noise. The 8,000 U.S. Marines of the first wave realize they're making history. When they hit the beaches, they will be the first American troops to set foot on Japanese territory in World War II. One of the Marianas Islands, 1,200 miles south of Japan, Saipan has been under Japanese control since 1922. It is a vital base on the Pacific sea routes to the Philippines and the rest of the Japanese Empire. The Marianas were very much a key portion of the inner ring of Japan's defensive system. So if they lost that, the inner ring was in serious jeopardy of crumbling. Planes based out of the Marianas could actually reach the Japanese home islands for the first time and start bringing the war to the Japanese. So it was very important for the United States. Commanded by Lieutenant General Yoshitsugu Saito, 30,000 Japanese troops defend Saipan. Heavy guns and mortars cover the landing beaches. The rest of the 85 square mile island is transformed into a maze of interlocking machine gun nests and bunkers. The key to taking Saipan will be the use of aerial photographs. For the first time, these detailed images are used to construct special 3D maps. We had uh, rubberized relief maps that enabled us to check out every terrain feature on the way to the objective area. The maps were so good that I could actually find little chicken houses that the farmers had in, the, in their backyards. Along with the natural features of the island, the maps show Japanese trench lines and bunkers near the coast. But though maps reveal the island's defenses, it's up to the men to do the dirty work. On board his headquarters ship, Invasion Force Commander Lieutenant General Holland M. Smith in glasses cuts through the bull 
and tells his men the truth. We learned how to pulverize atolls, but now we're up against mountains and caves where the Japs can dig in. A week from today, there will be a lot of dead Marines. Waiting to board their assault craft, Marines hear about the dangers of Saipan from another source, the Japanese radio broadcaster they call Tokyo Rose blasts around the clock. The foolish American forces are making a sad attempt to gain positions in the Marianas, but the Japanese are too strong for them. We heard uh, some Tokyo Rose broadcast when we were aboard ship, and she played good music, popular American music. Her propaganda was uh, so bad that it was humorous. She said, you're all going to be killed, and uh, why don't you turn back and go back home to your girlfriends, and, and uh, crazy things like that. At 5.40 AM, the men of the assault force climbed down to their waiting Amtraks, or LVTs. 700 of these amphibious vehicles will take them to the beaches, more than have ever been used in any island assault. Their targets are beaches on both sides of a Fetna point. To the north is the landing zone of the 2nd Marine Division, to the south, the 4th Marines. Now as Marine LVTs reach the reef, Japanese guns start laying down some lead. artillery from the enemy seemed to increase a great deal. Then in the lagoon, we started to take even small arms fire, machine gun fire. A lot of our uh, air traps get blown up in the water, completely uh, destroyed the personnel and the air track. It was, it, was, it was a lot rougher than we thought. So we were all hunched down in the Amtrak, uh, some praying, some swearing, everyone concerned. When the landing craft finally hit the beaches, 8,000 Marines storm ashore in just 20 minutes. I stepped out of my LVT, carrying my carbine. An enemy sniper actually hit my carbine right on in the magazine. And it was uh, several minutes before I was able to pick up a weapon of a Marine who had been, who had fallen. Under heavy frontal fire, the Marines make it to the tree line along the beach. But the Japanese react instantly. They just came out of nowhere screaming and hollering and waving their swords and firing at you and uh, throwing grenades and whatever. If they could keep you uh, on the shore, they had you beat. All the while, Japanese guns fire on the Marines from positions inland. But though the Marines are ashore, there's a problem. Strong currents offshore have pushed some landing craft away from their assigned beaches. As we drifted farther to the left of the assigned beach area, every yard we went to the farther to the north was another yard we had to fight our way back down to carry out our mission. The gap between the two marine divisions widens as they fight inland. Against desperate Japanese resistance, Americans start to die in droves. Our principal objective then was to stay alive ourselves not day to day, but from one minute to the next. The invasion plan calls for the LVTs to carry the Marines 2,000 yards inland to establish their bridgehead. But the LTVs attract Japanese fire. We got out of them as quickly as we could because 
They were a big target, and they didn't bounce any shells off. They just took the shells and blew up. Twelve noon. The American beachhead is still only 400 yards deep. In spite of the resistance, Marines head for their first target, the Japanese landing strip on the coast. We managed to get through the tree line and uh, took the fighter strip. At some loss, there's not much cover or concealment as you run across a fighter strip. As evening comes on, the order goes out to land no more troops until daylight. Only half of the planned beachhead has been captured. The Japanese still control the high ground overlooking the landing beaches. In the vicious fighting on day one, 2,000 U.S. Marines have been killed or wounded. The men ashore will have to cling to their positions overnight and wait for reinforcements. But General Saito's men are just as determined. They prepare a counterattack to blitz through the Marine lines. The biggest tank attack of the Pacific campaign is going to hit the Marines head on. June 16, 1944, day two. The men of the 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions have held their narrow beachhead through a tense and deadly night. Now reconnaissance aircraft track their advance as they continue the battle for Saipan. The first obstacle is the destroyed town of Charankanoa. We were never trained to fight uh, building to building and, and uh, house to house. You know, you open a, a door and there'd be a, a farm there, or a booby trap. A Japanese spotter is hidden at the top of a smokestack in a ruined sugar refinery. He calls in mortar fire on the unsuspecting Marines. There was some water available in Sharon Kanoa, and so we started immediately washing our faces and trying to get as comfortable as we could. Suddenly, we're on our bellies trying to dig holes with nothing but our chins and our fingernails and our knees. So within a matter of minutes, uh, I, I was actually a few inches down lower than the, the soil where I started. The smokestack is finally pulverized with artillery fire, and Charan Kanoa is captured. But as Marines move on to clear out Japanese bunkers, they face a new tragedy civilians on the battlefield. We, uh, of course, had to make sure there wasn't any uh, enemy in those holes. And uh, we, we did lose one fellow dead. He jumped down into the hole, and, and there was a very, very live uh, Jap down there who, who shot him and, and killed him. After that, we decided, well, we'll put a grenade in there. And unfortunately, the, the next one was occupied by a bunch of schoolgirls, little Chamorro girls in there. That was, that was really a sad, sad thing. But I guess that kind of thing happens in war. Six p.m. The Japanese know they have to counterattack before more supplies and reinforcements arrive for the Marine divisions. They prepare for a night attack. From concealed positions in the hills near the town of Garapan, the Japanese force heads south to attack the Marine bridgehead. Spearheading the attack are 44 tanks of the Japanese 9th Tank Regiment. In support are 500 infantry and elite paratroopers from the Special Naval Landing Force. 
Marines of the 2nd Division hear the sound of engines coming from the darkness. The most powerful tank force ever used by the Japanese in the Pacific is heading straight for them. 3.45 a.m., Marines open fire at point-blank range as the horde of Japanese tanks roars out of nowhere. They met us with their equipment, they met us with their tanks, they met us with their personnel. They were gonna drive us back into the ocean. We were uh, fortunate to be able to get them with, uh, with anti-tank grenades. And uh, we, uh, we left them a pile of junk. The largest Japanese tank attack of the Pacific campaign is obliterated. The Japs lost 24 of their 40 tanks just on the second night, and they lost uh, several hundred of their troops. As dawn breaks, fresh American troops begin to arrive in the bridgehead. This time, they are not combat-hardened Marines, but soldiers of the Green 27th Infantry Division. 7.30 a.m., the soldiers' first mission will be to help extend the bridgehead. As the 2nd Division arrives north toward Garapan, the 4th Marines and a regiment of the 27th Division head south for Aslito Airfield. Aerial reconnaissance shows a neat checkerboard landscape of sugarcane fields in their path. But for the troops on the ground, it is a suffocating nightmare. It seems as though they tentacles, they, they just go around you and you're fighting to get through them and, and you don't know who's on your left and who's on your right. As soon as we realized that they were hiding in these cane fields, we actually started setting the cane fields on fire. And this would force the Japanese out, and then where there'd be a real, real rabbit shoot. That evening, despite lethal resistance, the American bridgehead has doubled in size. The Japanese were fighting for a land that they considered essential to the empire. Therefore, they were dug in everywhere they could and imbued with their, their spirit of fighting, they would fight to the, the last drop of blood. Japanese medical orderly Taro Kawaguchi and his comrades are stunned by the power of the American attack. The strafing by enemy planes is terrible. And because of the constant naval bombardment, it is impossible to leave the safety of our shelters. The advance across Saipan continues. In the south, the 4th Marines reach the east coast and with the 27th Infantry capture Aslito Airfield. Japanese forces in the south of the island are now cut off. We found a big stash of sake and, uh, and, and rising sun beer. And we had, we drank quite, we drank quite a bit of it. And the word came out, don't uh, drink any uh, liquids that you find around. Uh, they've all been booby-trapped and they're poison. We're all looking at each other and wondering, well, when are we going to die? <laughs> Turned out it was a false alarm, much to our happiness. But for the Japanese on Saipan, there is no celebrating. From Tokyo, Prime Minister General Tojo sends a radio message to the garrison. Because the fate of the Japanese Empire depends on the result of your operation, inspire the spirit of officers and men, and to the very end, continue to destroy the enemy gallantly and persistently, thus alleviate the anxiety of our emperor. While Japanese troops take a pounding on Saipan, another battle is about to go down at sea. In one of the most decisive naval engagements of the war, 
the Japanese Imperial Navy tries to destroy the Saipan invasion fleet. The battle that follows will go down in history as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. June 19th, 1944, the Battle of Saipan, Day 5. Dawn. U.S. forces now control the southern third of Saipan. Marines and soldiers prepare to continue their battle for the island. But when they look out to sea, a shock rolls through the entire invasion force. Well, it was pretty leery when you look out there in the ocean and there's no ships. Wasn't a ship in sight. Their naval support has been called away to deal with a new threat. Japan has sent its most powerful fleet to help the trapped garrisons in the Marianas. The Japanese fleet consists of nine aircraft carriers, five battleships, and 13 cruisers. More important are its 500 aircraft. If they can reach out and obliterate the U.S. fleet, the invasion force will be trapped. A signal goes out to every ship in the Japanese fleet. The fate of the Empire rests on this one battle. Every man must do his utmost. But U.S. submarines spot the Japanese fleet as they approach the Marianas. The warning goes out to the U.S. fleet off Saipan to close in for the kill. They move out into the Philippine Sea to meet the enemy head on. 200 miles west of Saipan, the first Japanese airstrike of dive bombers, torpedo bombers, and fighters is launched. Warned by their radar, the 15 American carriers send 300 Hellcat fighters to take them out. Before the aircraft can make contact, American submarines make a do-or-die attack on the Japanese carriers. Two are ripped open by torpedoes, and fuel leaks trigger colossal explosions that blow them apart. The Americans won, the Japanese zip. 50 miles from the American carriers, the opposing air groups finally come face to face. It was really a slaughter. You could hear the battle, and you could, and we, of course, we knew a lot of the people that were jabbering on the air, but <laughs> I've just become an ace. I think I got five. Driven back, the surviving Japanese aircraft try to fly to air bases in the Marianas to refuel and rearm. But U.S. planes bring a deadly ambush. You, you can't believe what 650 calibers can do to uh, a plane like a Zero. I remember shooting down one of them. When it was 50 calibers, it, the, the thing just became confetti. It, it just exploded, practically. 12 noon, four Japanese airstrikes have been eviscerated. American pilots call it the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Japan has made a terrible blunder in its pilot training. The Japanese would keep their aviators in battle indefinitely, which meant you're gradually going to lose all your experienced aviators, and the trainees back in Japan will gain none of the benefit of their knowledge. The Japanese pilots are no match for American airmen. Nearly 300 Japanese aircraft have been destroyed in just one day. As night falls, the Japanese pull back, but the battle is not over. June 20th, 1944, dawn. Determined to destroy every last Japanese, American recon aircraft spend the morning hunting down the enemy. 4.15 p.m., a U.S. scout plane signals enemy in sight now the American carriers roll into action. After blowing away the Japanese fighters, American torpedo planes aim straight for the carriers. After only 20 minutes, Another carrier has been sunk, two more damaged, and all but 35 of the remaining Japanese aircraft have been shot down. But the American aircraft have flown so far, they are running out of fuel. 
and night is falling. They realized that uh, if we were going to get the airplanes back, they, they had to be able to land immediately. So they lighted the whole flight deck on all the carriers. Oh, it was unbelievable. 80 US planes crash on carriers or ditch in the sea. Another 35 have been lost in combat. But in two days, 426 Japanese aircraft have been annihilated. The far more experienced American aviators went into battle and destroyed the air arm of the, the Japanese in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. It was a slaughter in the skies. The aircraft carriers which spearheaded Japan's advance across the Pacific are now empty hulks. The Japanese Navy is powerless to help the trapped garrisons in the Marianas. While so much destruction has been taking place at sea, on Saipan itself, American progress has been painfully slow. It took forever. You'd go a couple hundred yards or something a day, and nightfall would come, and you'd stop and dig a hole. And I started hoping that they would attack you, you know, because that's the only, the only way you could get them. With the Japanese garrison fighting for every inch of ground, victory is still nowhere in sight. And now the Americans must enter the worst terrain on Saipan, the hellhole they'll call Death Valley. Eight days after the landings on Saipan, American troops are still fighting for control of the island. 3 p.m. The vital airfield at Aslito is open for business. P-47 Thunderbolts of the 19th Fighter Squadron fly around the clock in support of the ground troops. But Aslito also provides a base for reconnaissance aircraft. Within minutes of takeoff, they are flying over Japanese positions. Working in range of enemy fire, the photographic teams rush the images straight to staff, planning the next stage of the advance. June 23rd, day 9, 11.35 a.m., the U.S. invasion force has cleaved through Saipan. Now they must attack the Japanese main line of resistance in the center of the island. Facing them are 15,000 Japanese. Among them is Taro Kawaguchi. We received heavy casualties due to concentrated fire by land units and tanks and took refuge on top of the mountain. Ordered by the commander to be prepared to attack the enemy with rifles, grenades, or bayonets. The Marine divisions push north up the east and west coasts of Saipan. Between them, the 27th Infantry heads straight into some of the worst terrain in the Pacific. It's about to earn the name Death Valley. You, you dread the next day, you know, you do because it's gonna be the same things all over again. Kill or be killed. And uh, there was a lot of killing. You know, there was no quarter given either way. For the next five days, progress is agonizingly slow. The ridges and ravines around 1,500-foot Mount Tapachau are honeycombed with Japanese gun emplacements and bunkers. They have camouflaged their positions so skillfully that advancing American troops walk right into them. One time I was cleaning my rifle and I saw the, the ground open up and there was a sniper there. And he stopped firing. I ducked. Probably 20 or 30 guys fired back at him. They killed him. But again and again, the Marines' advance is held up by the 27th Infantry's lack of progress in the center of the line. The GI seemed too cautious to the Marines. The Army Division tended to start a little bit slower in the morning and would start with a big preparation of machine guns and rifles and whatnot, whereas we, we would move out until we contacted the enemy. That's when we would open up with our fire. 
June 24th, the flanks of the Marine divisions are taking enemy fire because the Army hasn't kept up with their rate of advance. General Holland Smith has had enough. He fires the commander of the 27th Infantry Division. And I think it was a good move because he didn't want to see the Marine forces absorb casualties because, in his opinion, the Army forces couldn't keep up. He wasn't out to get the Army. He just wanted to get people moving. The changes at the top don't alter things for the men in their foxholes. Day after day, under a baking sun and short of water, things get worse. Japanese snipers pick off the leaders, and concealed machine guns blast at patrols inching their way forward. It was hand grenades, it was bayonets, it was cane rifles, it was butts of rifles. It was a fight and counterfight, all the way to the end. After days of hardcore combat, a small detachment of Marines from the 2nd Division captures the summit of Mount Tapuchao. They blitz repeated counterattacks, and the Japanese defense begins to crumble. It was not easy uh, taking casualties because the, the dead and wounded had to be gotten down Mount Tapuchao, and that was done. Uh, hand to hand. It was a labor of love when you were moving a, a dead Marine down a hill like that. The 27th Division, under its new commander, Major General George W. Greiner, drives ahead to line up with the Marine divisions on the coast. In a week of nonstop combat, 1,400 men of the 27th Infantry Division have been killed and wounded in the fight for Death Valley. Day 19, as the Japanese in the center of the island pull back to the north, a regiment of the 2nd Marine Division attacks the town of Garapan. The problem was that they used corrugated iron sheets for their roofs, and they were all over the place. They dug a hole underneath and pulled one of those sheets over. That. Um, kind of fighting was new to us. And I had three guys down in no time at all. With the American line now stretching from Garapan in the west to the village of Hashigoru in the east, it looks like it's all over. But before the battle for Saipan is history, the Japanese have one more surprise in store. Soldiers and Marines will call it simply the raid, and those who survive will never forget it. July 5th, 1944, day 21. After a two-week-long struggle for the mountainous center of Saipan, American forces have now captured three-quarters of the island. 12 noon. General Holland M. Smith launches the final push to reach southern Saipan. The advance is still held up by die-hard Japanese. And this Jap was lying on his stomach, and he must have heard my footsteps. As he turned over, and he had a pistol. And I, of course, put a couple rounds into him from a, And I just looked at his face. He was blind. He was completely blind, and he was fighting, going to kill one more American if he could. Only a short distance to the north is the last command post of General Saito. Under constant shell fire from both U.S. warships and artillery, it is in an area the Americans call Paradise Valley. The Japanese call it the Valley of Hell. July 6th. Day 22, 10 a.m., General Saito gives a last order for the defense of Saipan. Whether we attack or whether we stay where we are, there is only death. 
However, in death, there is life. I will advance with you to deliver another blow to the American devils and leave my bones on Saipan as a fortress of the Pacific. The order that General Saito sends to his last troops calls for a Jyokusai. It's known as a bonsai attack, and it's a death sentence for Japanese soldiers. In a Jyokusai attack, units must fight on until they are utterly destroyed. They fully intended to give their lives. The word that the general had given them in his proclamation was, take seven American devils' lives before giving up your own. Seven for what? Having issued the Jyokusai order, General Saito has a last meal of tinned crab meat and sake. Then, with the help of his staff, he commits ritual suicide. July 7th, 1944, day 23, 2 a.m. One of the Japanese soldiers who will follow Saito's order is Taro Kawaguchi. He writes the last entry in his diary. Facing the dawn, the north, bowing reverently to the imperial palace and bidding farewell to my parents, aunt and wife, I solemnly promise to do my utmost. 4.45 a.m., the last Japanese attack of the battle for Saipan begins. Starting from Paradise Valley, more than 3,000 troops move south. The biggest bonsai attack of the war is about to hit the American line. Gathering speed like a tidal wave, the mass of out-of-control Japanese soldiers crashes down on the men of the 105th Infantry Regiment. So all you can see is the Japanese running, hundreds. Well, they come at us with everything now. They come at us with pitchforks, knives. They all didn't have guns. And we watched all the firing and the screaming and the hollering. And the, you didn't know how effective you were. You were just firing in the dark. I jumped into a foxhole with three men and a light machine gun. They were so overwhelmed, they didn't know what to do. I said, there's Japs out there, you gotta start firing. Well, right after that, the Japs raked the whole area with machine gun fire. And uh, a minute or two later, we all picked up, we ran back. Creating a human shield hell-bent on killing, the Japanese overwhelmed the Americans. On both sides, no quarter is asked or given. It is kill or be killed. So I jumped in a ravine and I turned around and I emptied another clip at the Japs. And uh, all of a sudden I found that I was alone. I looked to my right, nobody. I looked to my left, nobody. I turned around and that's when the shell lobbed right over my head. It went off on the side of the ravine, even with my face. Combat gets ugly at the command post of the 1st Battalion of the 105th. The battalion's commanding officer is William O'Brien. With a pistol in each hand, he fires into the mass of Japanese, defending his position to the end. The first human wave of Japanese soldiers goes hand to hand wherever U.S. troops manage to take up positions. Medics risk their lives to rescue the wounded. I lost the sight of an eye. I got shrapnel in my neck, shrapnel in my arm. I just went to my knees, made the sign of the cross, and I started praying. And all of a sudden, this medic came. He bandaged me up and brought me back to the beach. Though broken into small pockets, the American line holds. Fighting continues all day, and by 6 p.m., the lost ground is again in American hands. 
For all its ferocity, the largest bonsai charge of the Pacific War has failed. July 8, 1944, day 24, 7 a.m. When daylight comes, the carnage is beyond imagination. Bodies cover the plain and the beach. More than 4,000 dead Japanese are buried over the next few days. It's not something you can easily describe. Can you visualize 4,200 dead soldiers on, on a field? There were places where they were piled three and four high as they tried to advance over their dead. It was horrible, and, and all the dead there, the, the maggots were spewing out of, or the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the ears. The 105th Infantry Regiment has suffered terrible casualties. More than 900 men have been killed and wounded, as well as 127 Marines. Three men of the regiment are awarded the Medal of Honor for giving their lives to turn back the Japanese attack. One of them is Lieutenant Colonel William O'Brien. Though the fighting is over, Saipan has one more horror for these young Americans. The Japanese civilians on the island have been brainwashed by propaganda. They were so afraid of us because of what the Japanese soldiers had told them we would do to them. Uh, they fully expected to be tortured, raped, and, and murdered brutally. There were times when as many as 700 in, in one day committed suicide by jumping over cliffs. We try to stop them. They were so afraid of us from this propaganda that they threw their babies over and then jumped after them. It was horrible. It was the worst thing that I can remember of the war, and I hope uh, that I could get it out of my mind, but you can't. But Japanese-American interpreters persuade many civilians to surrender. Ragged and starving, they emerge from their hiding places. When we gave them candy and, and food and everything, it was just, it was, it was a, made it almost worthwhile to, at least we got a few of them saved. July 9th, 1944, the commanders of the invasion force finally declare the island of Saipan secure. The 24 days of the battle have seen some of the hardest fighting of the Pacific campaign. Against desperate resistance, soldiers and Marines have fought their way yard by yard to final victory. But the cost has been enormous. Nearly three and a half thousand soldiers and Marines have been killed and more than 13,000 wounded. For Japan, the fall of Saipan is the beginning of the end. Her last naval air force has been destroyed, and her inner defensive line is in ruins. General Tojo, the man who has masterminded Japan's war in the Pacific, falls from power. The Japanese realize that American bombers based on Saipan's captured airfields can now reach Japan itself. That led one of the, the top officers, after studying reports of, of the campaign, to just summarize, hell is on us. He knew that the bombers, the American factories are turning out by the hundreds, would be soon over the skies. And it would be a matter of, OK, now the war's right at our doorsteps. Hell is on us. Japanese troops on Saipan have shown how fanatically they will fight in defense of their own territory. The Americans who defeated them realized this was a cakewalk compared to what is coming. Each island was harder. Each island loved more casually. Each island was more fighting. Each island was more death and destruction. They really were a very determined foe, and uh, nothing came easily. But the courage of the young men who have broken Japan's defensive line has brought the end of the war one step closer. From now on, it's no holds barred on the march to Tokyo.